Well, good morning, everyone. I'm happy to welcome you all to our session today. It's kind of a rainy day out there, so it might be kind of fun to learn a little bit about uh, how we can monitor and observe and write down and track the coastal flooding that we experience. Looking uh, at the screen right now, that is a live picture of the marsh behind the Foundation of the Arts and Sciences. I don't know how many of you have ever been out on the marsh or taking a look at it, but uh, that's a pretty good indication about how high the water is today. And I'm going to take a minute or two to, to show you a couple of things that I do to monitor the water condition. And then, of course, Amanda in her talk today is going to go into some more details and show you some tools and some platforms. My day started off while I was checking my email, and I had an email that looked like this. It was from Stevens. Um, SFAS, which is the flood advisory notice, and I'm on their mailing list. So when they have a flood advisory, they automatically send me an email. And the neat thing about it is that the station that is that is monitoring the water uh, height is in Ship Bottom. So it's really about 20 blocks south of where my uh, place is. And the neat thing about it is when you click on the email from Stevens, you get this chart that is real time. So as you look at that chart, you'll see the dotted line running vertical, and that is exactly 11 o'clock, which is exactly what time it is. And that's showing how high the water is at that reporting station. The gray part of this chart is showing the variation of what their prediction is. And the red line is what they are predicting. And the dark red line is real time, exactly what the what the temper with the uh, the water level is so that's kind of cool but what does that mean well what we could do is we take a picture of that chart and a picture of the marsh and we say oh when the chart looks like this the marsh behind the foundation looks like that now since i live in surf city i took it to another level this is looking out uh my house is at 357 north 7th street so this is on a particular day it was october uh, in uh, in on 2019, and that's the water coming over the bulkhead at the end of the street. And here's what the chart looked like on that date. You can see it's up into the the uh, above three foot level. And then I took another one. This is to give you an idea of uh, at the Surf City Yacht Club. Sandy is up here. That's how high the water was with Sandy. And down here was how high it was on another day in October. Now, the one other thing that I included here is whether everything is related, that's what we're always talking about, and the weather is related to our uh, water conditions. And so there is a link out to the weather station, and this weather station is at the Foundation of the Arts and Sciences. So you can go to these weather stations and you can see precisely what are the weather conditions. It's real time, 24-7. And if you look at this histogram, you'll see it's kind of neat. This is showing that the temperature is dropping. And if you look at this, you see the wind is dying off. And if you look a little bit further, and if you're an amateur weather guy like I am, you'll see that this one is the uh, barometric pressure is rising. So as the barometric pressure rises, the wind dies down, and we get a cold front moving over. So all those things are all together. Amanda's talk today is going to help us understand how we can use a really neat platform that uh, that they put together at JC Near, and uh, and so that's what her talk is going to be like. I don't want to steal too much of her thunder, so I'm going to give up my screen right now. Let's bring up Amanda's screen. Um, if I could do that. Maybe I, Jenna, maybe I need a little help here. I'm not, oh, here it is. Stop sharing. Duh. <laughs> okay. So just a little uh, housekeeping and thank yous. I want to thank the foundation for hosting these sessions as they as they do. Daniela Kerner, who is the uh, executive director, is very enthusiastic about the art and the science coming together. We really appreciate the time that she and, and staff have 
devoted to this, uh, Jenna and, and Kate. So we want to thank them and, and remind you that uh, that is, the foundation is a nonprofit organization. They rely on donation and memberships. You may consider membership, you might also consider just supporting them by, by attending some of the great things that they have going on. Their summer catalog will be out in another month or two, I guess. And there's some really great stuff going on there. A uh, whole summer program, uh, kids camp, as well as, as other activities. So, so consider that. As I said before, our basic premise is that everything is related. So last week we were talking about the, the stars and, and uh, astronomy. And we were talking in the earlier ones about the, the animals that are in the sea and uh, in the bay. So since everything is connected and we are humans and we're connected to everything else, that's kind of the underlying theme of these, of these talks. And the foundation is really a good place to help us bring our interests with our recreation so that we can enjoy nature and then also learn how to, how to take care of it. So that's the that's the premise for today. Um, uh, just one final note: we will be using the chat session a number of you on other calls, and it's really helpful for you to put in, put your chats in. If we see some burning issue that needs to be addressed immediately, Amanda said she wouldn't mind being interrupted to answer a question during the presentation. But we'll mainly hold the questions to the end. So. I'm going to turn things over to Amanda. Amanda is the, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> communications coordinator for JC Near, which is the Jacques Cousteau Estuarian Reserve. Uh, I'll just call it JC Near because it's a long, long name. She's uh, homegrown. Uh, she went to Stockton, got her degree there, and she's been working in uh, in this general estuary for another five years. So, uh, so she's got real uh, feet on the street kind of knowledge and uh, and the insight. So I think with uh, further ado, I'll just turn it over to you, Amanda. Thanks, Rick. I just want to make sure everyone can see my presentation on the screen. Perfect. All right. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Amanda Archer. I'm with the Jack Cousteau National Estuarine Research Reserve, like Rick had mentioned. And today I'm going to talk about my coast, uh, New Jersey, which is a platform um, a citizen science platform and how you can capture science to inform coastal resilience planning. So to start off, I'm going to do a quick intro into myself and how I've got here. Um, I started my path with actually no familiarity to coastal estuaries or salt marshes. I grew up in East Windsor, New Jersey, which is closer to Trenton. Um, I've always loved nature and animals, but I did not find my way back to this path through education for a while. Um, it took me a couple years of thinking, oh, like, what do I love? What do I truly love? And there was a movie that came out in 2015 called Racing Extinction. And that was a real turning point for me. And it was about the ongoing anthropogenic mass extinction of species and the efforts to document it, um, mainly due to climate change and um, human expansion. So um, I went to Stockton and got a degree in environmental science. And you can see in the picture on the bottom left, that was when I first moved down to South Jersey. And it was like a whole new world for me. I fell in love with the salt marshes, the water, the estuaries, um, and everything in between. And with a lot of persistence and patience, I landed my first biologist position with U.S. Fish and Wildlife in 2021. Um, and I worked as a as part of a post Hurricane Sandy grant to do research on salt marsh restoration and monitor the implemented projects that they were doing um, at Edwin B. Forsyth. Um, I had a ton of great experiences and I made a lot of local connections in this field, all really packed tight within two years. And then seeing the changes happening on the ground in the marsh from being out there almost every day. You can see the picture on the bottom right. I'm knee deep in mud um, down in a salt marsh in Cape May. And uh, just being out there, I, I just saw all of the changes happening to the marsh um, due to sea level rise and climate change. And it had a really great impact on me. And so I was thinking, you know, we can't improve the management of coastal ecosystems without the people that inhabit it. So that led me to Jack Cousteau in the Coastal Training Program. 
Um, the Coastal Training Program offers education and training for coastal decision makers to be well informed on the science of coastal ecosystems in order to make informed decisions about the places we live. So here is a photo of the Jacques Cousteau Reserve. Um, we are one of 30 plus reserves across the nation that are created to promote the responsible use and management of the nation's estuaries. And for those of you who don't know what an estuary is, it's where a river meets the sea. Um, and it, we run a program combining scientific research, education, training, and stewardship at the Jack Cousteau Reserve. Um, it encompasses a patchwork of state and federal lands within the Molokka River and Barnegat Bay watershed. The Moloko River watershed is actually one of the most pristine and untouched watersheds on the East Coast, which is crazy to think that that exists in New Jersey due to the high population. But due to early protections of the Pine Barrens um, that are upstream in the Moloka River, we hold that standard in our Moloka River estuary. And so many researchers from other states come to the reserve to do research, and they actually use the Moloka River watershed as a baseline or control study site to compare to other sites that they might be studying that have a lot of human development around it and are really being impacted in a negative way. So that's a little bit about me and where I've come from. And so today we're gonna talk about the coast in coastal New Jersey. So what parts of New Jersey are actually considered the coast? And believe it or not, Coastal New Jersey is much more than just the barrier islands and the shore. Um, if it's touched by the tide, it's actually part of the coast. And so the dark blue shows tidal water bodies in the state of New Jersey, and the light blue shows the extent of municipalities that are touched by these tidal waterways and being affected by the tides. And so you can see the tidal flow goes all the way up and down these eastern estuaries, and then it wraps around the Delaware Bay and up the Delaware River into the heart of the state. So much of New Jersey is um, tidal. So where does the water come from? You might ask. Um, in a flood event, it can be one factor, or it can be a combination of factors. We have our usual low and high tides, um, and these are expected to rise about between four and five millimeters per year in New Jersey. Um, however, that rate is increasing over time as sea levels are rising at a faster rate. Um, we have especially high tides that happen when a new or full moon coincides with the moon being at its closest point to Earth in its orbit. That was a mouthful, but when the moon is closest to the Earth, we get those higher tide events, which is about once a month. And we like to coin this term a king tide. Um, if there is a storm, we also experience storm surges, which is a rise in seawater caused solely by a storm. Um, and this could be due to winds pushing it onshore. And tying this back to what Rick was saying about how weather is related to the flooding in New Jersey, this is a pretty good example of that. Um, and then with climate change, there are changing precipitation rates in, that are different in different parts of New Jersey, where extreme rainfall is becoming more frequent. And so my last point is current infrastructure in certain communities can't keep up with these changing conditions. And a perfect storm or a perfect flood is actually not always caused by storms, as a lot of people on Long Beach Island can confirm. Any combination of these factors can cause flooding in our coastal communities. So how is flooding in New Jersey changing? So flooding in New Jersey is changing in several ways. Um, like I said, sea level rise is happening faster in New Jersey than in other parts of the world. Um, and the severity of precipitation events is also increasing. And in the last 40 years, New Jersey sea levels rose almost twice as much as the global average. There is a 50% chance that New Jersey sea levels will meet or exceed 0 0.8 feet by 2030 and 1.4 feet by 2050.
So this is a part of a campaign that we did with my coast, um, which I'll talk about more, but this is what we talk about with sunny day flooding, um, used to describe flooding unrelated to storms and um, informing audiences of this scenario is very important, especially in Long Beach Island where you have folks that are traveling um, you, like for the summer to come and stay, they might not understand the changes that are happening as much as the residents do in Long Beach Island um, due to the increasing frequency of flooding. Um, and then also to the right, there's a photo of access to local tide stations. So what happens to natural features when this increase in flooding and sea level rise happens, such as salt marshes. So salt marshes are meant to be flooded. Um, they actually absorb flood waters and they build up sediment during these events. So as a high tide comes in, it usually brings in sediment and it's supposed to slowly accrete on top of the marsh. And that's essentially how marshes adapt to rising seas. However, some salt marshes can't keep up with the pace of how sea levels are changing and they can't survive under continuous flood conditions. And so in this case, we are threatened with the loss of this habitat in New Jersey. Um, New Jersey salt marshes are moderately resilient salt marshes and they can persist in their current locations if we take action um, to help them thrive, such as reconnecting them to the rivers that nourish them and um, reconnecting them to that sediment flow, also decreasing the influx of polluted runoff and removing invasive species such as Phragmites. Um, salt marshes are valuable not only for the creatures who inhabit them, but also in terms of buffer protection for coastal communities. It's a form of natural or green infrastructure when we pay attention to these salt marshes and what they provide to coastal communities in terms of protection from flooding. And so with that, I will go into what my coast New Jersey is doing to involve citizen scientists in some of this coastal resilience planning, whether it's planning for gray infrastructure, which is the infrastructure of stormwater and other management um, options, or if it's for green infrastructure, meaning restoring salt marshes, living shorelines and all above. Um, so my coast New Jersey is a portal used um, to collect and analyze photos of coastal events and places. And we created this in 2021 in partnership with the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, so these photos are linked to data about weather and tides, and they create reports that help stakeholders like government agencies, business owners, and residents to understand coastal change and make informed decisions. And so crowdsourcing these photos allows us to document the changes over time, even if it's a minute change, something that we might not see day to day, um, a photo can capture that. And also I just wanna mention this QR code on the screen. If you're interested, we do have an app. I'll have this up at the end of the presentation as well, but if you scan that QR code, it will bring up the MyCos app on your phone to download. And again, I'll have this at the end of the presentation as well, if you miss it right now. And by the way, those those links will be provided out at the foundation's website where you register for the talk. So we'll have those links there too. Perfect. So this is a graphic I put together to help explain the framework behind my coast. And so at the top of this graph, we have our citizen scientists or community members across the state that capture photos or tell stories based on their location. And as we all know, a simple photo can tell a thousand words. So it tells us what the story is in that particular location. And then we have data linked to add to that story and explain some of the things that we're seeing. Um, the use of this visual science and storytelling can be accessed and evaluated by land managers and decision makers throughout the state. So that's what we see at the bottom right-hand corner. Um, so the visual science and storytelling is actually getting linked to decision makers across the state, and it helps them make informed management decisions um, when they're planning for um, projects or, or other things uh, throughout the state. Um, and then the 
New Jersey DEP and the JC NEAR can use the photos that have been submitted in future education and outreach. So we know that there's people out there who want to contribute to climate solutions, and this is a way for you guys to contribute and have your voices heard in some of these planning efforts. So this is a slide showing all the New Jersey micro tools. I'm super excited. I was telling Rick earlier, we have a couple of updates and new tools added to this site. And this is the first time I actually get to publicly present it to you. Um, so we have a high water tool and that tracks flooding across the state. Um, we have a places we love tool and it allows you to document the coastal places that you love. We have our photo stations tool, which is community shorelines monitoring. That's the new one that I'll talk about a little bit later on. And then we have two campaigns called Know Your Tides and Rising Together New, Jer New Jersey. And that's linked between monitoring local tides and then sharing your flood stories. And I'll go into each of these separately. So here is an example of our high water tool used to capture flood events and impacts across the state of New Jersey. Um, you can see in the top right, we have the date and time of submission and the photo that was taken on the left hand side. So this automatically links based on the photo's location to the nearest tide gauge. So this, the nearest tide gauge in this report is off the coast of Atlantic City in the ocean. In the graph, you can see that the blue line represents the predicted water levels. And then the red line in the graph actually shows observed water levels. So in this scenario, the predicted water level was less than the actual observed and what we've been seeing on the ground. Um, the yellow circle on the graph indicates when the photo was taken. So this photo was taken right after peak high tide and it's taken a little bit on the falling tide. Um, and according to the weather, this is a case of sunny day or nuisance flooding from higher than normal tides because um, we didn't see too much rainfall. Um, and we also have the nearest riverine data and a map of where the photo was taken. So that's an example of a report. And what's unique about New Jersey My Coast um, is that there's a yellow button right in the center of the report. So if users were to click on it right here, it takes you to New Jersey Flood Mapper page. And this is an interactive mapping website designed by Rutgers University um, to create a user-friendly tool that will help get information into the hands of local communities who need to make decisions concerning flood hazards and sea level rise. So there are different functions and layers related to this tool. Um, a lot of it is over my head, but I can manipulate it enough to get the information that I need. So in this case, we have mean high high water, which is the highest tide line. And in this scenario, this is one foot inundation in low lying areas. So this is what the map looks like of Atlantic City with one foot inundation above high tide. And you can see there's a couple of areas that have flooding in the green, and that's due to water coming up the storm drains and infil infiltrating into the streets. This next photo shows how my coast is linked to New Jersey flood mapper. So we have our the location of our high water report on the map. And in this map, it shows now two foot of inundation in low lying areas. So what I did is I took the photo that we have seen and I matched it up to what the flood level looked like in Flood Mapper. So this shows us that this particular event was about two foot inundated over the highest high tide. Um, and so what's very unique about this is we can actually get on the ground photos using my coast to see what this looks like on the ground. And it's not just a map. Um, it really shows us what it looks like on the ground. And so in this case, this particular location happens to be a school in Atlantic City, which is deemed a critical asset. And that can be determined through New Jersey Flood Mapper as well. And this is what city planners use 
um, when doing hazard mitigation plans and all of that. Um, so the next photo is just, this is what it looks like with three feet inundation in Atlantic City. And you can see our school is right here. Um, and that's gonna cause serious problems with kids getting to school um, under that scenario. So this is a little chart that shows that we're expected to see more sunny day flooding in the, into the future. So in 2007, Atlantic City experienced about eight tidal flooding days. Uh, by 2030, there's a 50% chance that will increase to 34 days. And then by 2050, it could reach up to 120 days a year. So imagine kids not being able to get to school 120 days out of the year due to coastal flooding. Like that's pretty serious. Um, and we have to do some serious planning to mitigate these, these impacts. Um, another feature of my coast um, that we accept is submitting past reports. So if you have reports from back in the day, my coast allows you to upload pictures from any past flooding event. The date and time and location will automatically be linked upon sub submission. However, if that photo is too old and it's not embedded with the new technology, it's important to review when and where the photo was taken to ensure an accurate report. So when you submit your photo online, just make sure that the location of the photo and the time is correct and it's not taking you to your current location where you're submitting the photo. You wanna make sure that it's the correct date and time so we have the right information. And so we encourage submissions of past flooding so that we can compare them to recent reports. And this photo is an example of Ramapo River flooding in Pompton Lakes, New Jersey in April, 2007 which was submitted to my coast um, by a user. And so taking us to the next tool we have on my coast is the places we love tool. Um, and this documents places that community love, sorry, community members care about along New Jersey's rivers, estuaries and bays or even the ocean. Um, so this tool has the same features as submitting a high water report. However, this demonstrates more of a positive aspect to what we're seeing and it highlights important areas that users love and showing that you wanna protect and flourish these areas. Um, so very similar to the high water tool, but this it's just a place we love and then it allows you to pick ta tags as to why you love it. Um, when you submit your report. And at the end, I'll show you how this all these tie together and why it's important. This is the campaign that we did through my coast called Know Your Tides. Um, so essentially it allows um, people to be aware that high tide in New Jersey actually comes twice a day, um, whether you're by an ocean bay or tidal river. And so with sea levels getting higher and sunny day flooding on the rise, you can maximize your summer fun and stay safe by knowing your tides. And so it essentially teaches people how to use local tide predictions to plan for their time on the coast when they come to visit. Um, you can go on the app, you can link to a specific tide, uh, station and get the tides for your location through the app as well. This is another campaign that we did through My Coast New Jersey. I believe this was at the end of 2022 when this came out. It's called Rising Together New Jersey, and this takes it a little bit further than just a high water report. So everyone in New Jersey does have a flood story to share, unfortunately. Um, some stories are about small changes over time, and others could be life-changing events. So we encourage people to share their story in Rising Together New Jersey. Um, so we'll be better prepared to rise together into the future. And so when you click on submitting a Rising Together report, it will ask you a couple more in-depth questions. So what had happened? Where did it happen? When? How did this experience affect you? And did it change the way you think about flooding? So that's just 
something, if you were a part of a flooding event and you have photos that you want to share and tell your story, it's a forum to be able to do that and connect with other folks um, across the state. All right, so here is our newest tool on my coast. Um, we received interest from local stakeholders to install educational signage in public locations um, to capture coastal change in fixed locations. So we partnered with New Jersey State Parks to install interactive, what they deemed climate change learning stations. Um, we at my coast, we'll just, we just call them photo stations. So there's five locations among various coastlines, and we installed it climate week of September in 2023. So our shorelines are a dynamic system, and they constantly change due to tide storms and erosion, which folks on Long Beach Island can attest to. Um, by using the phone holder, park visitors can capture the same image over time and document any sort of environmental change, whether that's shoreline erosion, movement, um, vegetation changes, or damage from storms and high tide events. Um, the changes to these shorelines are documented in time lapse to show the increased rates of change along our coast. Um, really cool. I encourage everyone to check it out on the web page. There is actually a time lapse video for each location. So here are where the photo stations are located currently. Um, during this pilot project, uh, we have one in Liberty State Park, one at Cheesequake State Park, two located at Island, Island Beach State Park, one in Margate City and one at Cape May Point State Park. So this is an example of the changes that we've been seeing already. Um, these have been installed for about six months now. Um, and you can see the top photos. So the, the photos on the left are Island Beach State Park. The top one was a photo I took when we were looking to install these sign, signage and photo stations. Um, and then the photo on the bottom was when we launched, somebody submitted a report and you could see the, the changes in the dunes and even the vegetation change um, from a six month time period. The Margate City Pier, you can see the difference between a very, very low tide and a storm surge um, in the center. And then at Cheesequake, we have a marsh highlighted and you can see the different tidal stages of a marsh at low tide versus high tide. So those are a couple of um, documented changes we've had so far. And then this next one is just to highlight a king tide at Cheesequake State Park. So it was really interesting. We had about four submissions all within a 24 hour period and it documented each stage of the tide. So I thought it was really cool to share. Um, so the, the these are an example of king tides at Cheesequake State Park. So we have our high tide on the left, then it goes to low tide, high tide, low tide. Um, and that just shows the change, the you know unique changes there just from photos that were posted. And then on the high water page on my coast, we have when will tides be higher? So we do look at predicted high tides and send them out. Um, we do flood notifications through my coast if you're signed up with an account. And we also do use the Stevens system that Rick showed us in the beginning um, to indicate when a predicted high tide is going to come or a storm. Um, so according to the monthly high tide flooding outlook, these are the dates of the out of the month that are you're going to see a higher than normal tide. Um, we did a couple of campaigns in the past. Maybe some of you have contributed. Um, we call them a king tide photo contest. And when there is a king tide predicted, um, we host these photo contests through the website and give out prizes to um, the winner, whoever. So we have the public vote on the best king tide photos. And so this is an example of summer 2023. We had a king tide photo contest 
about 163 reports were submitted during that time period. Um, and so we deemed, we had two different brackets and then the two brackets went head to head. So we have our King Tide champion, who is George Noble from Keyport, New Jersey, with that beautiful sunset and the flooding going over the road. Um, and then a King Tide runner up and it shows some effects to the beach from uh, King Tides, some erosion on the beach. And so stay tuned because this summer we're looking to host something a little bit different. Um, this is our photo station challenge since we just introduced photo stations. Um, so follow one or more of these accounts on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date. Uh, we're, if you guys are familiar with the lighthouse challenge, uh, this is pretty much similar to that. So over the summer, we're going to have uh, folks who can take a photo station report at each of these locations. And then similar to the lighthouse challenge, um, you'll get a prize at the end if you complete all, if you visit all photo stations um, over the summer. But this is still in development. So um follow our social media pages to stay up to date on when and where that's going to take place. Okay, so this is probably the most important page to me, at least, um, in my coast, because this is where we can download your reports and start to put them together to make informed decisions about our coast. Um, so, this page shows where local decision makers can download these reports into Excel files. Um, you can filter your reports by county, municipality. Um, you can filter them by an event, a date range, and this can be accessed publicly by your municipality or local government. Um, there is something called CRS that helps you get a discount on your flood insurance. And so this is something that can help the municipality gain points for local planning and CRS activities. Um, using these images to track local flooding in coastal communities. Um, and then also this, this data, these, the most important part about submitting these photos is that we have documentation in hand. So if somebody wants to apply for a grant to improve infrastructure, um, do a restoration project, a living shoreline, we have these photos. Um, to put in these funding applications um, in hopes of beefing it up to be able to be funded because we have all this documentation supporting the need for funding to go to this particular area. And so this is just a little bit of my Coast Analytics so far, we have about 700 users with an account. Um, since we started, about 4,000 reports have been submitted. And last year in 2023, I sent out about 15 flood notifications, notifying um, members that there is going to be a predicted king tide or flood event or storm. Um, and then there's just a couple of quotes from folks who I've worked with in workshops um, about my coast. So I love citizen science projects, seeing changes over time and our coast is very impactful. And she would love to find more ways to use it in the classroom. So what is to come from my coast? Um, we wanna use continued use of this platform to go beyond coastal flooding. So to be able to install more photo stations and to document shoreline changes, um, we want to incorporate using citizen science reports to habitat restoration sites. Um, there's a lot of interest in that. And also, we want to engage educators to use My Coast New Jersey in classrooms um, as a local on the ground climate change education tool. So for the state of New Jersey, um, I believe it was last year, educators are now teaching climate change in schools, and so they're looking for content and things to bring into the classroom um, to teach their students about climate change, and this is a really good tool that could be used in classrooms, so we're working on with educators to see how we can do that. 
And so you want to take part, but what can you actually do? Um, so I encourage all of you to download the app and sign up for these high water alerts. Um, you can post your photos and stories to my coast and share on social media. Um, I encourage you to attend community events and become a My Coast Amplifier because if you are posting these reports, we want to make sure they're being used by your community and helping you obtain funding um, for infrastructure habitat restoration projects to improve your resilience to withstand coastal flooding and other impacts due to climate change. Um, visit a photo station. So like I said, we'll be hosting the photo station challenge over the summer. So be on the lookout the lookout for that. And um, I'm also in the process of making flyers to help folks navigate themselves on where to go to visit photo stations. And then just keep using My Coast New Jersey because we can't do it without your reports. We can't, you guys are the ones that help run this. Um, your reports are really helpful in informing us on where we need to focus our attention for coastal resilience planning projects. Um, and so I promised you there would be a QR code to download the app at the end. This is your chance. Um, if you're interested, if you don't have My Coast on your phone, you can open up your camera app and scan the QR code and it will take you directly to the app download link. And then lastly, if there are any questions, I just want to point out that this is the photo station at Liberty State Park. So this is what the shoreline view of Liberty State Park looks like. Very good, very good, very good indeed. One of the things that I was uh, fiddling around with while you were doing that was I went out to that Stevens and typed in the date. The neat thing about that is that you can change the date so you can see how high the water was in ship bottom on the date that it, you were showing of the water over in Tuckard and wherever that was. Uh -huh. uh, and it was kind of interesting to then, not everybody is as geek as I am, but but it's kind of interesting to be able to see where something is flooded in one part of our estuary and then what is another part of our estuary like on the same day with the same, the same event. Of course, uh, tidal times are different, but by seeing how high it got and how high it was in Atlantic City is kind of interesting to be able to tie some of those things, uh, cut some of those things together. Yeah. I had a I had a question and that was you mentioned that if uh, if a, a municipality or if a person is seeking a grant mm -hmm. that you've got the data to help them be able to document what was happening on certain flood events whether whether it was a sunny day flood or not. Now, do you? put that together for someone who's doing, uh, who has a project like that, or do they need to use the tool to do that themselves? So that's, so they can contact me and I can help them explore the data for that. Um, but we have this website, it's, you can download reports um, without even having an account. So municipal members can go on the site and download the reports that they want based on the time, like if there was a certain flood event, or they can filter it by their municipality and see all the reports in that municipality and use all that data um, to put in their grant applications. Cool. And I think also Diane maybe had a question that was uh, the, the photo um, locations. Are you thinking of having any of those on LBI? Yes. So, Manahawkin or? Yeah. Um, Definitely looking into Holgate as a potential option for a photo station. However, it recently got demolished by the last storm. So I've heard um, it and it's really like that area is really suffering. So we're going to reevaluate and see where we could put a photo station without it getting knocked out. Yeah, well, I might suggest that the foundation looking out over the marsh. Absolutely. That's a pretty good indicator. Yeah. Yeah. Got opposed. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, are there any I, other questions, ask if Amanda, Darlene, Darlene? Yep. Sorry, Rick. If, Amanda, if you can drop a link right into chat mm -hmm. where people can 
download the app. I think that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then what would, what, what would we do to continue the conversation of possibly getting a photo station at the foundation there? I, I, can, I think that's a great spot. And then I often see um, some pretty serious flooding. Uh, it's probably in Surf City, Harvey Cedars, wherever um, Black Eyed Susans is. It looks like they're really struggling there a little bit more. Is, is yeah, there anything? And as a matter of fact, in Surf City, I guess it was two years ago, their Taxpayers Association had an interesting project. I did a talk there, and then they gave out yardsticks so people could take a picture of the flooding with the yardstick to see how deep the water was just to be able to tie that tie that together, which I thought was kind of interesting. I know that there's somebody on from Surf City. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think the challenge for Surf City is to get the municipality, with all due respect, off the dime and start to do something about the information that can be provided about what the conditions truly are. But the more documentation, the better. I think it gets to a point where people can no longer ignore it um, or deny that it's actually a, a problem. So this is this is great. And I, when they were doing that, we did introduce a number of people to my coast. And I think there was a flurry of pictures that were put up there, but it'd be great to uh, to update that. And since I don't live on the island full time like I used to, I, I'm not there to take pictures of some of these uh, some of these storms as they come through. So maybe some of the people that are on the call could do that. Flood Mapper is is a is a great way to do it, and it's very simple, very simple yeah. to use. Um, Darlene, to answer your question about the photo stations. I'm currently taking, like, if there's any interest locations where a photo station, where you would like a photo station to be installed, um, we have funding to install between five and 10 in the next year or so. Um, but working with partners, um, we, we're taking, like, interest from folks who are interested in having a photo station. So I put my email in the chat. If you have a really cool location that you want us to check out, um, we're definitely interested in uh, looking at it and seeing what we can do with that. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, um, as I've said in the past, we, we started off with 22 people and we wound up with 25. So, uh, Amanda, you get an A for the day. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do all this. I, I'm sure that the people found it uh, interesting and, and hopefully it'll be helpful and they can actually do some things. I'm just noticing a comment here. Maybe put a photo station near the LBI Yacht Clubs um, to cover the whole island. That, that'd that be kind of interesting too, because you'd have Spray Beach and a Little Egg Harbor down south and then um, and then Bargate Light, Surf City. Uh, that's kind of an interesting idea. Yeah, we'll we'll we will send you an official notice of of our interest. Awesome. Yeah, I'll be looking forward to it. Great, Darlene. Do you have any closing comments, observations, anything? No, just a I guess just a reminder that April is Citizen Science Month. So it's if you're looking for a reason to get involved, all of April is a nice time. Download the app, experiment with it, see what you think. If you're doing beach cleanups, if you're doing marsh cleanups, there's a lot of activities happening during Earth Day too. Very simple way to layer reporting onto what you're already planning to do in April. Darlene, really an excellent point that LBIF is having a marsh cleanup on Earth Day. So April 22nd, if anybody's interested in attending, you can register online or you can just show up. Uh, we'll be, it's, it'll begin at 10, 10 a.m. and usually runs until early afternoon. Very good. Yes, we we want to be sure and remind people that. And so just in closing, remind a reminder that next week we have um, Ben Worst, and he'll be talking about the Osprey projects. And those of you who haven't heard Ben, he is Mr. Osprey. He can tell you so much, and he's a very, very good speaker. And uh, I, I would highly recommend if you can if you can get on to uh, to to hear him. Well, All right. Well, then I just want to add one other thing about April is MyCoast, if you use the same email address to create your MyCoast account as you use, if you have or create a SciStarter account, they're all linked. In other words, MyCoast, we work with a lot of federal agencies where some of that initial funding came from. 
it is actually, they're all linked. So you can track your participation across many different projects, as I mentioned before, but MyCoast is a very good, strong affiliate. So very easy to do that. Good point. Yeah, that's a good point. I'd well, also add just one thing. Yeah. Um, my coast is not only in the state of New Jersey, like I'm focused on New Jersey, my coast, but if you're visiting other states, if you look on the general my coast website, I think there's about 10 other states that use my coast. So if you're on vacation in another state and you want to see what their campaigns look like, uh, some of them even do, we don't have too much of it around here, but like abandoned boats, um, they track abandoned boats, um, throughout their state. Um, another one is the beach cleanups or pollution, trash. So if you're on vacation in, in another state, your MyCoast account will then transfer um, and you can use MyCoast throughout, so. Very good. Okay, see you all next week. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Everyone, take care, bye. Thank you, Amanda, Rick and Darlene. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yeah, uh, did you, uh, Jenna, did you want me to stay on here or are you going to give me a call on my cell? I'll give you a call. Okay, talk to you later. Hi, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.